For the next three weeks, uh, we're going to talk about a series I've entitled, Let's Go Defense. Let's Go Defense. And before we get into it, so there was a few years ago, uh, I did a series entitled Team Church. And that's where we compared the church to an NFL football team. And there's some similarities. And so I just want to remind you of those similarities. And then we're going to get into what I really feel like God's laid on my heart. But comparing a, a NFL football team to the church. Well, first of all, you've got an owner. And how many knows the church has got an owner? Father God, amen? And so, we, but, but if you look at an NFL football team, you'll usually see the owner, and he's sitting up in the skybox. A lot of times you'll see his son sitting beside him. This is, look how sad he is. I would be too if I owned the Dallas Cowboys. But anyway, <laughs> the Lone Star State. But uh, so this is, Jerry Jones and his son, and they're looking down on the field at their team. Well, you know, we've got the father and the son, and he's looking down on team church. And I know Jerry Jones spent a lot of money to buy the Dallas Cowboys, but not near as much as Jesus uh, uh, paid to, to purchase the church. Amen? It cost him the cross. So you've got owners that are looking at their, at their team, and then you've got uh, on the sideline the head coach of the team, and uh, that's even worse, the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> I got depressed last night before I started preaching looking at these people. But you've got the head coach. Well, how many knows that Jesus sent us a head coach called the Holy Spirit? He is here to coach team church. Then you've got uh, uh, pastors and teachers that's been called to get with the head coach, to, to get with the players. And so we've got the, the head coach and the quarterback, and, and he's getting the play from the head coach. And then the pastor, the teacher, the quarterback goes out and he huddles his team to call the play that the head coach is calling. And then you've got the fans in the stands. And boy, we got some ugly ones up here. It's called the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> but let me, let's talk about that a moment. There is a big comparison. You've got the owner of the church, Father God, and Jesus Christ bought the church with his blood. And then Jesus said, when I go back up into heaven, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He is the head coach. Then you've got pastors and teachers that teach the body of Christ. And if they spend time with the coach, with the Holy Spirit, he's got a word. That, that's why the Bible says, uh, give heed to what the Spirit is saying to the church. And then you've got a huddle. This is a huddle. Let me remind you, this is not the game. This is just the huddle. Sometimes we think because we went to the huddle, we've played the game. No, no. The game doesn't start until we go outside these doors, okay? And, the, and then you've got the fans in the stands. And listen, sometimes when the pastor says amen or break, too many of the church go sit in the stands. Don't leave me on this field by myself. And listen, if you're in the stands, that means you're dead, because if you look at Hebrews, the fans are those who's gone on before us. And the Bible says in Hebrews that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses and they are cheering us on. Who's that? So if you're not in heaven today, you've got to get on the field. Okay? Now, here's what I want to get to. For a football team to win, they've got to have a good offense. But for a football team to win, they've also got to have a good defense. Right? Football team's not going to win championships without a good defense. Well, Life Church, I believe, now listen, we can get better. We've got, we still got a long ways to go. But I believe Life Church, you, me, we have a pretty good offense. Again, we can get better. We need to train more. But we've got a pretty good offense. What do I mean by that? Our goal is ever so. Our goal, our goal is to empty hell and fill heaven. That's why we do so many things outside the doors of this church to love on our community in the name of Jesus. Why? Because we, we're, our goal is every soul. That's why we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on the duo ministry. Why? So we can go out in the streets, not just keep it to ourselves and say, listen, Jesus Christ loves you. So we've got an offense, but I'm going to tell you something. We're going to have to step up our defense. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, well, first of all, let me read you these scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Notice what Peter says. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a, everybody say defense. A defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So the Holy Spirit through Peter talking to the church, he said, hey, make sure you have a good defense. When you're questioned about your faith, when your faith is being attacked, and I'm going to tell you something, faith is being attacked in our nation like never before. And he said, make sure you have a defense. 
Uh, notice Philippians chapter 1, verse 16. This is the Spirit of God through Paul. Notice he says this. They preach because they love me, for they know that I have been appointed to defend the good news. Paul says, I'm all about defense. And then in Jude chapter 1, verse 3, notice this. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else. What are you writing about, Paul? I mean, Jude, listen to what he says here. Urging you, notice this now, to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. He says, I want to, I'm urging you now. Hey, have offense, go after salvation, help people find salvation. He said, but I want you to also, don't forget, I urge you to have a good defense. Now, here's the challenge that we have, especially the way the culture has changed. The challenge is to, have, uh, to, to play offense, if you will, without being offensive. Can we play offense without being offensive? See, when the church becomes offensive, nobody listens to us. When we're, when we're madder than God, nobody's going to listen to us. So the key is to play offense without being offensive, but the key is also to play defense without being defensive. Remember, the Bible says that Jesus came in grace and truth. He didn't just come in truth. He came in grace and truth. See, if we'll extend grace, they're more likely to listen to our truth. The Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. So I want you to have that in your mind when we're talking about having a defense of our faith today. Now, here's why this is so heavy on my heart. Um, our youth, and we've talked about this a lot the last couple of years, but our youth, their faith is under attack like never before. I mean, things that we never faced, guys, in school. My kids, Chris will be 27, Emily's 22, and just, just a few years ago, it's like they were in elementary school. But listen, it's nothing compared to what our elementary school kids are facing today. And we've got to help them have a defense. And the church has got to step up in this area. Listen, while I was off, I didn't just waste time. I spent time studying God's Word, spent time uh, just praying and seeking the Lord. He shared so much with me that I'm going to share with you in the next few weeks and months to come. But I also talked to some pastors and a, a pastor and some other administrators in our community, we're talking about how do we rally and how do we have a good defense for what our youth are facing today? And we'll talk more about that. But I want you to know our youth are struggling. I encourage some of you to take time to talk to your children before they go to bed, in the quietness, just talk to them, ask them how they're doing because they're under a great attack. Listen, it was that way when I was young. I graduated in the 80s. Now, I know it's hard for you to believe as young as I look. But I actually thought in the 80s, it can't get any worse than this. How many knows it's gotten a lot worse than the 80s? But I thought it can't get any worse than this. I really struggled. And some of the areas I struggled in, I'll just be honest with you, I struggled in my mind a lot. Uh, why? Why? I had, uh, if they were diagnosing when I was a kid, ADHD, I'd have had A-A-A-A-D-D-D-D-H-H-H-H-D-D-D-D, literally. My mom said, I beat you more than all my other kids put together. Yeah, everybody say, oh, you won't get any sympathy out of her. She's 91 at 10 o'clock, four foot 11, I'm still scared of her. But you couldn't keep my attention in school. I had severe, uh, you, you know what, uh, my, uh, my mom's uh, Ritalin, in that uh, a medicine? My mom's Ritalin was a belt and a switch. But I got a, I got a whip in my first day of kindergarten. That's kind of how my whole school career went. But I, hear me, I couldn't shut my mind off. I began to struggle. You know how kids will say, where did God come from? And those kind of things. I never got beyond some of that. I, I would... I would have so many doubts and deep, I mean, I mean, I remember going to my mom and I would be talking about galaxies and the universe and she's like, are you on drugs? You're only four. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, I really struggled with some severe doubt in school. And I struggled with God, science, and the Bible. Because see, that was just beginning back then to really come under attack through some of our science teachings and things of that nature. But it really became a stronghold in my mind. 
And I remember asking my mom, and my mom would say things like, just believe. Just believe the Bible. Now, let me tell you something. My mom was not just a simple person who didn't use her brain. My mom is a very brilliant person. She was salutatorian of her graduating class. But the difference was when my mom was in school, faith wasn't attacked like it was in my day and even much more now in our day. I mean, my mom will tell you her English book was the Bible, okay? And so she wasn't, she wasn't always, her faith wasn't always under attack. I didn't just overthink with God. I overthought in every area. I'm just going to tell you, I'll give you a little story I've never shared with, with, with you ever shared with it because I don't want you to think that I'm bragging because I'm not bragging because I couldn't do it again in a thousand years okay but I'm just telling you how my attention span worked so in seventh grade they introduced us to algebra math was my worst subject believe it or not my favorite subject in school was English I even liked diagramming sentences I know isn't that weird no wonder he started doing drugs but uh (laughs) Math was my worst subject. It, I just, I had a hard time concentrating. So now in seventh grade, Mr. Carr starts teaching us algebra. I'm like, are you kidding me? We're never going to get out of this class. I mean, we went from fractions. I was doing okay. But when they started putting the alphabet in with them, yeah. and he's using the whole chalkboard to do one, one, one problem, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And so what I did is I'm I'm trying to get out of that as quick as I can. So this is the first day of algebra, and I just figured out a way to do it in one step. Inverted a fraction on this. And so I went up to his desk, and I said, hey, can I do it this way? And so I solved the problem, because before it was taking me half a page, and I just solved the problem. He goes, do that again. I did another one. He said, do that again. I did another one. He said, go sit down. He never did tell me if I could do it that way or not. (laughs) Listen to me. The next day, he came to class and had Davis Law written on the chalkboard. (laughs) He went over Tennessee Tech and showed them how I was doing that problem, and it became a law. I know. I mean, the whole class was like, him? He's a dork. (laughs) My point is my brain never shut off, so it really messed with me in school when they started interjecting all this stuff that would question the things of God. Can I tell you it's worse today? They are literally, I'm not not talking about our schools and our educators, but I'm talking about the culture in our nation today. They really hate that your kids might believe in God. You need to understand that. So we got to have a good defense. Um, They are being confronted with arguments that if they're not careful, they don't have any answers for. My college students, when I did Tennessee Tech College Ministry, my college students really struggled. And so I started sharing some of the things with them that helped them that I'm going to share with you. But notice this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3. The world is unprincipled. It's dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way, never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire, notice this now, massively corrupt culture. How many know we have a massively corrupt culture on our hands today? We do. We're not being offensive about it. We're not screaming and yelling. But we are facing a very corrupt culture today. Now notice what he goes on to say. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God. Folks, that is happening in our educational system today. They are, this this corrupt culture we're in, are using warped philosophies to erect barriers between our children and, and us and our God. Notice what Paul says about it in Romans chapter 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, notice what they do, suppress the truth. Their goal is to suppress the truth. In unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse." Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now notice this, professing to be wise, they become 
fools. Listen to me. Our young people today, and we also, but especially our young people, are being taught by wise professors who are nothing more than suppressors of the truth. Listen, they're not all about education today. They're about indoctrination today. Okay? And they are suppressors of the truth. Now you know why they say, and psychologists are telling us, that this is the most depressed generation ever been raised in America? Talk to the psychologists that go to this church. Our young people are more depressed than any other generation in society today. More suicides in young people today than ever in the history of America. Can I tell you why? Because they have suppressed the truth. And see, remember what Jesus said? The truth shall set you free. The reason our, our young people are not living in freedom and in joy, and the reason they're being bound, and the reason they're depressed is because they're, they're facing a culture who wants to suppress the truth out of their lives. What do they do? They used warped philosophies which are barriers that are erected against the truth of God that would set them free. Now, Paul says, God has given us, the church, powerful tools that will smash these warped philosophies. A defense, if you will, if we'll use it. We're going to talk about three and only one today. Biblical authenticity, supernatural authenticity, and personal authenticity. And let's just today touch on biblical authenticity. You understand that Satan's first attack against humanity was against the Word of God. That was his very first attack. If you go look at Genesis, well, let's just look at it. Genesis 3, 1. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, yea, notice these three words, guys, hath God said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden. Hath God. That's exactly what he's using today. That his first attack on humanity was to get man and woman to question the authenticity of the Word of God. Hath, hath God said Genesis 1 1 is true? Hath God, does, does the Word of God really mean what it says about marriage? Can you fudge on it just a little bit? Hath God said, and, and he's still using those three words today. See, when Satan fires his missiles to bring doubt, we can shoot them down. How? We have the same defensive weapon that Jesus Christ used in the wilderness when Satan came at him. See, Satan came at mankind, Adam and Eve, with hath God said. He wanted to question the validity and the authenticity of God's word. He did the same thing with Jesus. When he came to Jesus, he said, hath God said you're the son of God? Are you really the son of God? Then prove it. Three times he came at Jesus with, hath God said? All three times Jesus responded with, God hath said. See, Eve done good the first time. When Satan, go back and read it. When Satan first came at her and said, hath God said you shall not do that? Eve responded with, God hath said. But how many knows he don't quit? He's persistent. And he kept coming at Eve with, hath God said? Hath God said? And Eve finally went from, Hath God said to, from God hath said to, has God said? Is that really what he wanted me and Adam to do? And see, Jesus never went from hath God said, uh, God hath said to hath God said. That's what he wants to do in our lives today is to get us to question the word of God. Um, let me just say this. The Bible has been the most attacked manuscript or book in all of our history, no book has been attacked like the Word of God. The Koran, no other religious book has been attacked like this book. You know what's crazy, though? All these years, for thousands of years, it's been under attack, but it still outsells every other book in the world by millions every year. Why? Because God has said. That's why. I love this story. Listen to this. French philosopher Voltaire declared in 1776, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible in the earth except one that is looked upon by antiquity, a curious, uh, curiosity seeker. 100 years later, Voltaire was dead and his own house and press were being used to print and store Bibles by the Geneva Bible Society. 
In 1778, Voltaire bragged, it took 12 men to start Christianity. One will destroy it. He called Christ the cursed wretch. Approximately 200 years after Voltaire's prediction that the Bible would be eliminated from the earth, a first edition of Voltaire's uh, work sold in Paris for 11 cents. On that very same day, December 24th, 1933, the British government purchased an ancient New Testament manuscript for the Tsar of Russia for $500,000. God hath said. You see, folks, the scientific community for the last 150 years has tried to destroy the Bible. For 150 years, they've tried to cancel this book that we call the Word of God. And their main attack has been on Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God. See, if they can cancel that, in the beginning God, then they can cancel the rest of the book. But here's the problem. They can't cancel it. The deeper they get into science, the more they see his thumbprint. There's a guy, if you're going to ever go watch this guy, Frank Turek. He's on YouTube. You can watch him. He's an apologist. For Christianity, he's, he's brilliant. And uh, he was just talking about some of the things I'm sharing with you. And he said that, that some uh, scientists and mathematicians got together and were just wanting to do the possibility by accident that life on earth could just happen by random chance. And he said what they discovered for life to have happened just the way it has and the solar system being just like it is, that the probability would be one part in 10 to the 40th power. Now, that means nothing to me and you. That's like speaking in tongues. He said, so let me tell you, let me give you an illustration of the chances that life would have just happened. He said, take the North American continent, fill it with dimes, and then stack them to the moon. And then do that a billion times. And then put on one diamond X, throw it in there, blindfold your friend, and put him in there, and he'll pull out that dime. Let me say that again. Fill the North American continent with dimes, stack them to the moon, and do that a billion times, and then somebody blindfolded, pull out one X with a dime on it. God has said, did you hear me? Our children need to be told this side of it. The Bible is gaining, by the way, much validity among many scientists in the world today. Now, many of them have have admitted now that it wasn't just some random explosion. They're admitting now that there was an intelligent design. They just still won't, many of them still won't give God the credit. We'll talk about why here in a moment. But one of the scientists who was a very outspoken atheist ceased, he was very renowned in 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 our day, and he was one of the men who discovered the, the GNA strand and genetics. And, and after that, he not only ceased to be an atheist, he became an outspoken Christian because he said, you can't get away from somebody designed us. See, here's what people don't understand. And some of you may already know these scriptures, and if you do, bear with me, but some people don't. But the, the Bible is not a science book. But listen, the Bible made scientific statements thousands of years ago. Um, Until just a few hundred years ago, man still thought the world was flat. Now, some of my family in Bangham still does, but I mean, (laughs) but seriously, you know this. They thought the world was flat. We, We didn't have the advantage of being able to go in space and look back at the earth. And so we just assumed The world was flat. Notice this verse from thousands of years ago. Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he, talking about God, who sets above the circle of the earth. How did he know that? Who sets above the circle and his inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. A few hundred years ago, that man thought the earth not just was flat, but set on a foundation. It was on some big foundation that the earth was set upon. We didn't know that planets orbited and how the earth just kind of hangs in space. We had no idea. But notice Job chapter 26, verse 7. He stretches out the north over empty space and he hangs the earth on nothing. Show them that picture. 
That's what Job is talking about. Listen to this. He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Do you understand that Job's the oldest book in the Bible? Genesis is not. It's the book of beginnings. God gave Moses the revelation of creation. But the oldest book in your Bible is Job. And Job says, hey, he hangs the earth on nothing over empty space. Oh, this book is fascinating. Fall in love with it. It'll change your life. One of the big questions, this was some of the things my college students would come to me with, is what about the dinosaurs? Where'd Barney come from? How does he fit in all this? Job 40, verse 15. Notice this. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. So he's saying he made this creature the same time he made man. He eateth grass like an ox. Lo, now his strength in his loin and his force is in the navel of his belly. Now notice this now. He, moves, he moveth his tail like a cedar. Do you know how big a cedar tree is? You're talking 80 to 100 feet. That's not your dog on your front porch. Notice this. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bar, bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. Notice that. He is the chief. You know what he's saying there? It's the biggest creature God has ever made. He, made, he that made him can make his sword to approach him. You know what he's saying? Of this baby, only God can approach this one. Notice this. Surely the mountains bring him forth fruit food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reeds and fins. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brooks compass about him. Behold, behold he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up the Jordan into his mouth. You thought your mama-in-law had a big mouth. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just, you do, right? No, I'm doing. Anyway. This book is fascinating. The authenticity of the Bible. There's no book like it. It is the word of God. Scientists tell us that 90% of our universe is made up of dark matter. They still don't know what it is, but they know it's there even though they can't see it. But it's what created this universe. Notice this. Dark matter helps physicists make sense of how galaxies formed in the early universe. We know that dark matter had to be present to be part of the process. The astrophysicist Katie Mack explains it's believed that dark matter coalesced together in the early universe before normal matter did, creating gravitational wells for normal matter to fall into. Those gravitational wells formed by dark matter became the seeds of galaxies. So dark matter, check this out, not only holds galaxies together as Rubens work and plot, it's why galaxies are there in the first place. So these scientists, these physicists are saying what we can't see made what we can see and it's also holding those things together so what we can't see made what we can see was that familiar hebrews eleven three. by faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of god so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible Physicists are saying not only did this invisible force create everything, but this invisible force is actually what's holding everything together. Where do we find that in the scriptures? Colossians 1.15. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold. Everybody say it together. Jesus is the word of God. And the Bible says that Jesus, the word of God, remember God spoke? And it says Jesus not only created all things, but it is also he and his word that holds all things together. You see, folks, people don't reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. People reject the Bible because it contradicts them. Um. I'm going to end with this. There was a book that I introduced my college students to years ago. And if you've never read it, I want to encourage you to get it. And get it for your children. But it's called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Anybody know who Lee Strobel was? If you don't know, Lee Strobel, back years ago, was a very outspoken atheist. He wasn't just an atheist for himself. He didn't want you to believe in God either. He was a journalist for the Chicago Tribune, huge newspaper, I mean, these newspapers, New York Times, you know, they used to all be much bigger before the internet came. 
But Chicago Tribune was a very famous newspaper in his day. And so he was a very outspoken atheist. Well, his wife made some friends with, with some other ladies who happened to be Christian. Well, she ended up getting born again. She ended up getting saved. It ticked him off. He didn't want his kids raised in that mess. And so he goes to the editor of the Chicago, Chicago Tribune and asks, can I do an investigative report on Jesus Christ because I want to prove to my wife how stupid that is and to everybody else, it's not real. He's not who he said he was. So the editor said, go for it. So for two years, he did an investigative report on Jesus Christ of Nazareth, on his resurrection, on the, on the ancient manuscripts and all that, to prove to his wife what you're believing is stupid. Well, let me just fast forward. Two years later, he not only quit his job as a journalist, he became a pastor. God hath said. I said, God hath said. Now listen. Men, listen, men don't reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. They reject the Bible because it contradicts them. We want to do what we want to do. That's our culture today. We want to do what we want to do and answer to nobody. We got to have a defense, guys. Let me just tell you one more thing. If you do go get the case for Christ, he just came out with a new one. I started reading it while I was off. Uh, it, and it's a, um, it's a case for heaven. It just came out in 21. And what he did, Lee Strobel almost died a couple years ago. And after that near-death experience, he told his wife, he said, I want to use my journalism background. I want to do an investigative report on heaven. And so he traveled the whole world interviewing doctors and people who had died and left their body and come back. And here, here, here's who he is. He said, I wasn't going to do one of those uh, reports of somebody said they died. And yeah, and I saw Jesus. He had shoulder length hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, cool sandals. He said, anybody can say that. He said, I wanted documented medical. And I'll just, one of the stories in the beginning of the book is a lady who was in her 40s uh, had had a massive heart attack and died, flatline. And they got her back a few minutes later. And after they got her back and was able to get her in a step-down room and talk to her, she begins to tell them, she said, I saw you guys the whole time. She said, I left my body and I was at the ceiling and I saw where all of you were at, where the doctors and nurses were standing. And they were like, mm, okay. And she said, well, I didn't stop at the ceiling. She said, I continued to leave my body. And she said, I actually was up over the top of this hospital. And if you will send somebody up to the roof of the hospital, and she called a certain ledge over when she said, there is a blue tennis shoe with a worn out spot over the toe and the laces are tucked under the heel. And they sent somebody up there and found that shoe. And there's stories like that. And then he gets into the last part of the book of is, does the Bible uh, coincide with the accounts that he discovered or is it just, you know, uh, some other book or is there some other belief? And he said, every one of these lined up with scripture. One he tells about, they all didn't see a light. One guy was a university professor who was an atheist, hated the thought of God. He died and when he left his body, he tells them that he started down this, these creatures came and got him and started taking him down this hallway and it got darker and darker and darker. And he said, finally, they started biting me. Remember weeping and gnashing of teeth? He said, they started biting me and he said, it was worse than any horror movie you could ever watch. And he said, all I need to do is cry out to Jesus. And he cried out to Jesus and he came back into his body. He's no longer a professor today, now he's a pastor. Can you say God hath said? God hath said? Listen, this book is true. And we need to teach it to our children. We need to give them everything they can to have a defense. And let me just say this. This is what I'm encouraging the church to do. Over these next couple of weeks, know why you believe what you believe. Know why you, why do you believe what you believe? Because somebody in your family told you? Because your great, great aunt went to church? Know why you believe. Why? Because that's going to create a better defense in you. It says when somebody comes to you, you ask why the faith is in you. Don't say, well, hold on, let me get mama on the phone. Or let me get Pastor Bob. 
No, know why you believe what you believe. It reminds me of a story I've told uh, before, and some of you may not have heard it, but it goes so well with what I'm talking about right now. But sometimes we just don't know why we believe what we believe, such as the, the young girl who was watching her mom prepare a roast, and her mom pulls the roast out of the refrigerator, and the first thing she does is cut both ends off the roast and starts marinating and stuff, and all of a sudden her daughter said, well, Mom, why do you do that? And she said, what? She said, why'd you cut both ends off the roast? And she said, mm, I don't know. I just always saw my mom do that. So she called her mom on the phone. She said, Mom, Sally asked me why I cut both ends off the roast. And honestly, Mom, I don't know why. I said, I just always saw you do it. Why, why do you do it? And she said, mm, I don't really know. She said, I always saw Mama do that. So she calls her mom, who is an elderly woman at this time, and she calls her mom and she says, Mom, she said, uh, Sally asked Jeannie, who then asked me, why did I cut both ends off the roast? She said, Mom, I really don't know. She said, I just always saw you do it. Why do you do that? And she said, well, honey, that's how big my pan was. <laughs> know why you believe what you believe. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Don't, don't be looking stupid. <laughs> 